All right, all right. Shalom, shalom, family. Shalom, shalom. Welcome back. Welcome back, everybody. Shalom to everybody that's tuning in, and shalom to everybody that'll be tuning in later. All right, so we're finally getting around to this video. All right, Sambanyong, river location found. All right. Um, we were supposed to bring this out last Shabbat, but unfortunately, uh, we had a few difficulties here at home with the tornadoes and everything. Had um, you know, electricity problems and stuff for a couple of days. Um, over the weekend, so we didn't get to bring this out, but we back this Shabbat, and we're going to bring this information out. Uh, we're going to try to present the best case for what the Shabbat Yon River is, or Sambat Yon River really is, um, where it was located, and to do this, we're going to be using the, um, we're going to be using the oral traditions of El Dad, the Danite. All right, we're going to be using the oral traditions of El Dad the Danite. We're going to read over a couple different sources to um, expound on this claim or to expound on um, what I'm saying. All right. So, um, again, we're going to go through a couple different sources and just, you know, build up on everything and show the evidence to why I say the San Bayon River is where I say it is. All right. And again, we're going to be using the oral traditions of El Dad the Danite. If you don't know about El Dad the Danite, he was um, a Jewish traveler um, from the Sahara Desert, or we're just going to say for the, from the Sahara right now. Some um, some historians say that he was an Ethiopian Jew. Well, most historians say that he was an Ethiopian Jew. But the evidence that I'll be bringing out today is um, it's going to show something very different. All right. And it's going to support it's going to support our claim even more to being Israelites. All right. But we're going to read over, um, you know, a couple different, I guess you can say translations and renditions of his um, or traditions and what he wrote. And again, this is or tradition passed down for um, thousands of years, I believe, or either hundreds. So um, this is um, what Eldad got when he came on the scene in the ninth century, passed down over these centuries. All right. So. About to go ahead and get started. But before we get started, we're going to give our praises, honor, and glory to the Most High, of course. All right. All praises, honor, and glory to the Most High for bringing us here today to review this information. All right. Let me just get on my phone, make sure we good and everything on my end. And then we can get started. All right. Make sure we can see the screen and everything. One second, one second, family. All right. So, first source we're going to be reviewing today is from the Jewish Quarterly Review. All right, to the bottom left. All right, and this was um written in 1889. All right, and we're going to be starting at the top. Right here where it says, in the name of the Lord. All right, in the name of the Lord. Get my layers on and we can get started, family. All right. Shalom, shalom to everybody that's in the chat. All right. So in the name of the Lord, the God of Israel, praise be the name of the King of Kings, the Holy One. Blessed be he who has chosen out, excuse me, chosen Israel out of all nations, who has given them the law and the commandments, who has separated them from the 70 tongues and who has ordered them to keep the 613 precepts. So long as Israel fulfilled the will of God, no nation could, could subdue it until Jerubal, the son of Nebat, rose and sin and made Israel sin by making two golden calves. All right. And again, this is from the oral traditions of Eldad. All right. So this is what he's um, retelling. It goes on to say, then the kingdom, of the house of David divided and Jerusalem, um, excuse me, Jerubim, and gathered together the ten tribes and told them, Rise up and make war against Rehoboam and Jerusalem. They, however, answered, Why should we fight against our brother and against the son of our masters, David, the king of Israel and Judah? All right. So the elders of Israel said, There are no more valiant 
warriors in all the tribes of Israel than the tribe of Dan. Therefore, Jerubim ordered the children of Dan to make war against Judah. All right. So just a little background on what's going on right now. Um, this is during the, the split between Israel and Judah. As we can see there, um, Jerubim, Jerubim is trying to make them go to war against David and Judah. All right. Or the kingdom of David and Judah. But they go on to say, they, however, said, by the life of our father's son, we will not fight against our brethren and shed their blood for nothing. All right. This is what Dan said. And they gave themselves up to the death. They took their swords, spears and bows in order to make war against Jeroboam. But God saved them from shedding the blood of their brethren, for they proclaimed throughout the whole tribe. All right. Throughout the whole tribe of Dan. Fly to Egypt. And they took counsel to destroy Egypt and to kill all its inhabitants. But their princes said to them, how could you go to Egypt? It is, is it, excuse me, is it not written in the law? Ye shall not then again, no more. All right. Or oh, excuse me, should, ye shall not see the, excuse me, you shall see them again, no more. Excuse me, family. But it goes on to say, they then took counsel to fall upon Edom, Amalek, and Ammon. When they heard that it was written in the law, that God had forbidden Israel to possess their territories. All right, we see the scripture verse or reference. Finally, God gave them good courage and advice and advice to go up the river Pisai to continue their wanderings on camels and encamp until they reached the land of Cush, Ethiopia. All right, so the Pisan or the Pishon River um, will have to be the Nile, according to this, because again, they um, went on the Pishon River and they continued wandering on camels and encamped until they reached the land of Cush or Ethiopia, which they found fertile with numerous vineyards and gardens. All right. The Danites settled there or settled here and made a covenant with the children of Cush that they should pay tribute to Israel. Thus, the Danites dwelled here for many years, multiplying and increasing greatly. They were then followed by three other tribes, all right? So they were then followed by three other tribes. And it's very important to note before we even continue that the time of Jeroboam's secession, so the, the beginning of what we was reading, or the time of these wars that they was talking about, or the time of Jeroboam and David period, this was like 930 BCE. So we will see the um, tribe of Dan actually migrating to Ethiopia around the uh, you could say the 900s BCE, and then following that, the tribes of Naphtali, Gad, and Asher joined, and this will um, actually be during the time of the Assyrian captivity, but we're going to bring that out later. But it says, they were then followed by three other tribes, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher, who crossed the desert and encamped until they came into the territories of Dan, so they knew where Dan were, so they said, we're going to go and camp with Dan, all right? In the land of Cush during this time. In their wanderings, they slew many Cushites in a territory extending four days' journey in each direction. And they have been fighting with seven kingdoms until this day. And these four tribes, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher, and those who dwell in the ancient Havila. All right, so keep that in mind. We're going to touch on Havila later because that's going to be very important to identifying where these um 10 tribes or these specific tribes that Eldad is talking about in his or traditions went to, where there is gold, trusting in the Lord who helped them against the kingdom of, and it doesn't say, and these tribes put their hands on their neck of their enemies. All right. And we're going to continue to bring out another source. And this is actually um, a source from 1838. And this is free, it's, um, it's in French, actually, and but it's called. Relation, the Eldad, the Danai. Again, this is just a rendition or a translation from Eldad's original uh, journals and accounts. But again, we're going to be translating, or we have page 28 translated, and we're going to actually read what it says. And again, relationship, chapter two, how parts of tribes. Or Zebulun, Asher, and Naphtali followed the children of Dan, immigrants, and Cush. All right, and we just read over this, but what we're going to see is in this translation, it gives us a few more details that the last one didn't. All right, so we're going to see that this um, French source actually gives us more details that the last source didn't. But it says at that time, 
several families of the three other tribes of Zebulun, Asher, and Naphtali also excuse me, expatriated themselves and encamped in the Arabian desert. All right, so this says they went to the Arabian desert, specifically Zebulun, Asher, and Naphtali. Remember, Dan was already in Ethiopia. All right, so they encamped in the Arabian desert until they had reached the borders of Cush. Excuse me. They waged war on the Cushites and killed them as long as they depopulated a space of four days out of four days of March to the place occupied by their brothers of the Dan race. All right. So it's also important to make this connection right here as well, because we see that when these tribes came in, they was going on a rampage. They was, you know, slain or um, killing a lot of these Cushitic tribes, and they was also enslaving them. And if you know about the Bantu expansion, the Bantus were doing the same thing. And we've also connected the Bantus to these Northern Kingdom tribes migrating to Africa. All right. So this is a, um, a pretty good correlation to the Bantu expansion when they actually came into East Africa and was doing the same. And even when they went into South Africa. But it says, having chosen Havila as his abode which should not be confused with the Eastern Havila. So this is very important. This author just said this shouldn't be confused with the Eastern Havila. So the question would be, what Havila did they go to? Having chosen Havila as his own abode, which should not be confused with the Eastern Havila, where there is gold and Seba and Sabta and Ramah, and Sabacha, and Sheba, and Dedan, these four tribes, Dan, Zebulun, Asher, and Naphtali, were forced to fight against these seven kingdoms, all right? And if we look at this map, this is a pretty good map outlining some of these tribes or these kingdoms. And these actually are sons of Cush within Eastern Africa. And we see, um, for some reason, he put some of these um, territories within Arabia. I'm not sure if these are actually in Arabia. But we see Seba and Sabaf and Havila and Sibachicha. But notice again, he said not to get this confused with the Eastern Havila. And even over here, it says the Oriental Havila. So again, page 29. Soon they made the heads of their enemies bow before them and they established themselves in their places in these seven kingdoms and never let excuse me nevertheless each year until this day they are hostile with seven other tribes forming as many sovereigns called Dimani, Kabar, um, Koraita, Bedra, Nabat, Hor, and Yabo. As a result of these continuing wars, many Israelites were scattered across the rivers of Cush. All right. And again, we already know this going into Zephaniah 3 and 10. And it says so that the word of the prophets on um, word will come true or the words of the prophet would come true, which it did from beyond the rivers of Cush. My dispersion shall bring me offering. So, again, he said that they didn't go to the eastern, Havi excuse me, the eastern Havila. All right. They went to another Havila. And he also said they ended up fleeing or being scattered across the rivers of Cush, as the words of the prophet came true. So, again, Eldad said they would have came down. They went through Egypt, and they settled there in Cush, or Ethiopia, or the eastern Havila, all right? Because of war and continuing wars with those Cushetic tribes, they ended up being scattered beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. All right, or beyond the rivers of Cush and to the Western Havila. All right, and we always we already know that West Africa is known for its gold. We have the gold coast of um, you know, southern, I guess you could say Ghana down here at the bottom, and also the ancient Ghana was known for gold. All right, this was known as gold, this was actually the gold kingdom. We know the Arabs used to come down here, trade gold. With the people in these locations and everything. But again, Zephaniah 3, 3 and 10, from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my supplements, even the daughters of my dispersed shall bring my offering. It's important to note that Eldad's or traditions, literally, 
you know, told this whole story, told, told this whole verse right here, Zephaniah 3 and 10. And shalom and shalom to everybody in the chat. So now we're going to identify Western Africa or Chavila as, you know, Ghana. And to do that, we're going to go to the itinerary of Rabbi Benjamin of Tadella, all right, 1840. And we're going to start at the top. All right. And it's, again, it's important to note that they did not settle in the eastern Havila. So we have to identify which Havila they were talking about. From Aswan to Chulon, 12 days, this place contains about 300 Jews. And it's the starting point of the caravans who transverse the desert, Al's Tahara or the Sahara. In 50 days of their way to Sevilla, the Chavila of Scripture, which is in the country of Ghana. All right. So, again, they said they would transverse the desert, the Sahara, 50 days on their way to Chavila of the Scripture, which is in the country of Ghana. This desert contains mountains of sand, and wherever or whenever a storm arises, the caravans are exposed to imminent danger of being buried alive by the sand. Those which escape, however, carry iron, copper, different sorts of fruits, pulse and salt, gold, and precious stones are brought from dents in exchange. And this is important. This country lies westward of Cush. All right? Zephaniah 3.10 says the same thing. Eldad says the same thing. All right. So, again, this Havila was 50 days from and even Asuan. This is within Eastern Africa. So they would travel 50 days from Eastern Africa across the desert to Chavila, which is in the country of Ghana, which lies westward of Kush or Abyssinia. All right. So that's very important. So we're starting to identify these locations. Now we're going to read another source, A History of the Jewish People, 1934. So, start at the very top. It says, some 40 years earlier, another visitor was entertained by the Jews of Kariwan, Eldad, son of Mali, the Danite, alleged that he was a descendant of the tribe of Dan, he related that this tribe had immigrated from their Palestinian home as not to take part in the civil war at the time of Jerusalem's secession. All right, and this was, it could be circa 900 BCE. All right, and this is way before the Assyrian exile. This is like 100 something years before the Assyrian exile. And it says, and we're residing in the land of Abila beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. All right, and we're residing in the land of Avila beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. So when scholars, when Jewish um, historians and things like that say that Eldad was talking about, you know, Ethiopian Jewry, they're just telling half of the truth, you know, because again, it says they continued on beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, but we're going to continue to bring that out. Three other tribes, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher were with them. These had joined them in the times of Sennacherib, opposite them lived the children of Moses, sprung from the Levites, who had multi um, multiplied the fingers of their right hand, rather than to sing the song of Zion by the rivers of Babylon, and had then tr translated by cloud to their present abode. All right, so he also says the children of Moses had came, had came in as well. But it's important to know he said that these tribes came in during the time of Sennacherib, and that will be um, during the times of the Assyrian captivities. So again, we have another source saying that ten, the Northern Kingdoms was actually coming into Africa during the times of the Assyrian captivity. All right? So his own people, so Eldad continued, were able to communicate with them only by far, since they were cut off from one another by a waterless torrent which carried masses of sand and rubble with such terrific force that it could crush an iron mountain 
This impassable river rested on a Sabbat day when it was enveloped in a thick mist, hence the river was called or named Sambadion. All right. So notice, we didn't hear anything about a river throughout this description. Again, Eldad stated, a waterless torrent, waterless torrent, which carried masses of sand and rubble with such terrific force that it could crush an iron mountain, all right? So he wasn't describing a river. So what was he describing? Let's continue on. The Jewish Quarterly, 1889, source to the left. The river Sabat Yon is 200 yards broad, about as far as a bow shot, full of sand and stones, but without water. So this is not a river because it has no water. So let's continue to listen and, you know, get the details of what he's actually saying. All right. He said it's full of sand and stones, but without water. The stones make a great noise like the, excuse me, like the waves of the sea and a stormy wind so that it might Excuse me. So in the night, the noise is heard at the distance of the half of a journey. He goes on to say there are sources of water which collect themselves in one pool out of which there are water or excuse me, out of which they water the fields. All right. So there are sources of water. But it's not what he's describing. He says these actually goes out to water the field. There are fish in it, all kinds of clean birds that fly around it. And this river of stone and sand rose during the six working days and rest on the Sabbath day. And soon as the Sabbath begins, fire surrounds the river and the flames remain to the next um, evening when the Sabbath ends. And again, these are all traditions that are um, passed down over, um, I guess you could say hundreds, perhaps thousands of years to El Dad from um, the tribe of Dan, first migrating in and then the Northern Kingdom, the um, other tribes coming in and following them. So what he's saying right here could be some mystic things added on to why he's saying certain things like um, on a Sabbath day, it's um, it's surrounded by fire and things like that. Um, just, um, just, just to throw that in there. But again, he says it is a river of stone and sand. All right. It is a river of stone and sand, but without water. It says, does no human being can reach the river for a distance of a half a mile on either side. The fire consumes all the all that grows there. The four tribes, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher, stand on the borders of the river, all right? So the Sambat Yon River is full of sand and stones, but not water. And this actually correlates with the Sahara Desert, all right? This actually correlates with the Sahara Desert. How would they go beyond the rivers of Ethiopia to get to Havila? They would cross the, the um, Sahara Desert, <laughs> all right? This is the Sabbat Yom that Eldad was talking about. Crossing the Sahara, the stormy winds, the loud winds, the sand, the stones. All right. And there's also northeast winds called Harmontan, which affects the Sahara Desert with strong, forceful winds. And I actually brought this out a couple of videos ago when Mungo Park was actually in the Sahara Desert. And he showed that it was a northeast wind. That was coming in effect in um affecting the Sahara Desert, and actually that this word right here is of Hebrew origin, and that he found the lost tribes of Israel in the Sahara. But again, it is as if the Sahara were a great ocean of sand and rock, the Sahel. On the southern fringe of the Sahara is the Sahel, a marginal area of transition. From desert to savannah, the Sahil is an Arabic word for shore. All right, you get what's going on here. The Sahil is the Arabic word for shore. It is if the Sahara were a great ocean of sand and rock, the camels that transport goods across the desert were ships. All right, so you get what's going on here. You get why Eldad said that this was a river. All right. And the large market towns were the seaports. So again, it is as if the Sahara were a great ocean of sand and rock, the camels that transported goods across the desert were the ships. So the Sambayong 
it's actually it's actually the Sahara Desert, all right? So the San Bayon is actually the Sahara Desert, all right? And Havila that Eldad was talking about is actually within Ghana, the land of gold, not the Eastern Havila. Also remember Dan, Naphtali, Gad, or excuse me, that would actually mean that Dan, Naphtali, and Gad and Asher would be within Western Africa. And we can actually locate these people or locate tribes that have these ancestries. All right, so the question is, where was Eldad from and who are the tribes identified? Or who, he's, or who was he talking about specifically? Let's see. So, source to the left, the untold story. Edgar Shaw, I'm gonna start at the highlight. It says, the Hebrew Academy in Fez, or in Fez, competed with the one in Quran, Algeria. There were many debates and lectures between the sages and the scholars of these schools, all right? So there were many debates and um, Lectures between the sages and scholars of these schools. Eldad the Danite, a Hebrew from the Jewish kingdom of Ghana. Right. So I'm not I'm not tripping when I say Eldad the Danite was talking about Jews in West Africa. You know, I'm not tripping when I say the Sambat Yon is the Sahara Desert. And I'm definitely not tripping when I say Havila is the ancient kingdom of Ghana, specifically the Havila they was talking about. Again, the source said not to be confused with the Eastern Havila. So what Havila is it? All right, so Eldad the Danai, a Hebrew from the Jewish kingdom of Ghana. So that's where he was from. Hebrewism is West Africa, page 228. Starting at the highlight. It says, does not a Jew of the tribe of Dan who had been from Curran to the country of the cannibals, tell us in the ninth century of a Jewish empire in the Sahara, which extends over 200 days march. All right. So again, they were, they were, um, they're proposing or asking a question here and they selling you does not Eldad the Danite, does not a Jew of the tribe of Dan tell you about a Jewish empire in the Sahara. All right that extends over 200 days march all right so they know that this empire actually existed in the sahara but it goes on to say according to this eldad the danite they had there in the interior of africa a language seemingly phoenician and, and excuse me and a religion which was that of joshua and a jewish emperor all right and a jewish emperor all right so again I'm just identifying Eldad the Danite with West African territories, West African provinces. Last source said he was from the kingdom of Ghana. This was letting us know he was from a Jewish empire within the Sahara. Now we're going to identify these things later. All right, so next source to the left. In 1447, the basin, do Niger, or the basin of Niger, all right? And this was, uh, I actually do believe this was composed or written or published within 1918. And again, this is in French as well, but you already know we have the translation. All right. So we're going to start at the very top. It says, there was at the time or at a time when the descendants of these bellicose Jews and bellicose just means like uh, barbaric or um, warlike or savage. So these warlike Jews from Caesarea and Mauritania or Tignit or Tignitine, who did not have fear to compete with the Roman army, had been the masters of the Sahara. One of theirs, Eldad from the tribe of Dan, assigned Senegal and Niger, Kator and Kukia as the boundary markers of their empire. This is in Western Africa. This is in the kingdoms of Ghana and Mali. One of their own, or one of theirs, Eldad from the tribe of Dan, assigned Senegal and Niger and Kator and Kikuya. And of, of, excuse me, as the boundary markers for their empire, 
even today, says Mr. Lee Chandler, the Moorish tribes which surround synagogue present many individuals in which the Hebrew type is strongly marked. El the Danite, which arose in the ninth century on the borders of Sudan, claimed that his tribe had emerged from Palestine after the death of King Solomon. He spoke a particular Hebrew, excuse me, quite, excuse me, he spoke particularly Hebrew, quite related, it seemed to the Phoenician, and he recognized no other religious authority than Joshua's, the Jewish empire of the Sahara, to which Eldad lent an extent of 200 days march, disappeared during the Arab invasions, all right? And we know the um, empires that disappeared during the Arab invasions were actually the Mandi empires of Ghana and uh, Mali. All right, these kingdoms were actually um, sacked and invaded and actually took over by these Arab, Arab powers when they invaded, as Eldad said. So even Eldad knew about these Arabs coming into Western Africa and taking over these kingdoms. So again, Eldad literally assigned Senegal, Niger, and Kator, and Kukia as the boundaries markers for this empire all right this is what he said these this empire was and where it strikes from this is what he meant when he said this empire stretched over 200 days march all right archives moroccans all right 1905 and again if you all want these sources let me know i give you the page number you can get this um translated yourself you know what I'm saying? Just to, you know, see it yourself if you want. But again, we're going to start at the highlight. It says, we must add to this information that Eldad the Danite had been accompanied in his travels by another Jew or by another desert Jew. All right. Another desert Jew who traces origins to the tribe of Asher or Asher, son of Jacob or among the Mandi or Soniki tribes. Come on now. We must add to this information that Eldad the Danite had been accompanied in his travels by another desert Jew who traced his origin to the tribe of Asher, son of Jacob, or among the Mandi or Soniki tribes. We know these were the Bunny Israel. These people were the Bunny Israel who some trace their origins back to their chiefs of Israel, right? So they even trace their self back to the chiefs of Israel. We must, or we must find one indeed by the name of Aser. And some of the Taniki also used to speak, I believe it's either a language that they used to speak name is Aser, or some of these people were called Aser, all right? But again, this is important because Eldad couldn't have been in East Africa if he's dealing with people of the Mandi and the Saniki peoples, all right? And also, it's important to note, if Eldad was from Ghana, then he had to be a Mandi. He had to be one of those people. He had to be one of those Israelite, from one of those Israelite tribes ruling. And we know those Israelite tribes ruling the kingdoms of Ghana and Mali, the, uh, the kingdoms he identified were actually the Mandi people, the Bani Israel. As it just said right here. So let's identify that though. The black Jews of Africa. All right. The black Jews of Africa. We're gonna start at the very top. Yes, brother. I just um to the brother in the chat. I'm looking at the chat from my phone. I'm gonna drop the um sources for all of these tonight. Once I get done, I'm gonna bring the sources and I'll actually uh, make a post. Letting you all know the source is in the um is on is in the links. Or the links is in the bio, rather. But again, starting at the top. It says it is tempting to merge this information about a Jewish presence in the south of the Sahara with the traditions of El Dad the Danai. And it's really not tempting. All right. It's um it's just factual. Who in the ninth century claimed that the Jewish tribes ruled these regions. However, this claim has been strongly challenged by Raymond Money, who considers these tribes or these or considered that these black groups were probably Suniki. 
All right. So he's saying that these tribes that Eldad was talking about were probably Suniki, who were conquered and dispersed by the neighboring Berbers, who were not really Islamized in the time of Al Adrisi. All right. So again, Raymond Muni basically was saying that Eldad was talking about the Suniki. But again, it goes on to say, it is therefore not surprising that a century later, they are presented as professing a religion that was a mixture of all sorts of things, and that, that as they were not considered as Muslims by the Arabs, and not wanting to be called heathen, so it is, excuse me, so as to avoid the faith reserved by Islam for idolaters, these Sunniki simply declared themselves as Jews, thus the people of the book. All right, so they like, man, we Jews, we the people of the book. All right. They simply declared themselves as Jews, thus the people of the book. The Tariq al fatash also mentioned the existence of a colony of Banu Israel, or Israel, living in Tamarima, in the southeast of Timbuktu, in the place where the city of Tamarima was founded in 1496. A Israelite population had formerly lived whose wells and tombs still remained. These Jews who inhabited the place until the 15th century lived on agriculture and had dug wells because they grew veg excuse me grew vegetables which they sold and um for which merchants paid them considerable amounts of money all right so what i'm doing right now is basically trying to identify or identify some of these people that um l dad was actually talking about and right now we're dealing with the mandy people because Basically, Eldad was from the kingdom of, um, I guess you could say this West African kingdom of Ghana. And um, the people of Ghana was these Mandy people, or the Bunny Israel, which we're going to bring out. So, source to the left, myths and legends, as functional instruments in politics, the establishment of a Wali dynasty in Morocco, all right? The Journal of African History, all right? And we're going to start at the very top. It says the first example is a tradition recorded in the Sudanese Chronicles, the Tariq el Fatash, all right, 16th, 17th century, in the years of 902, that is the year uh, 1496 or 7, the city of Tamarima, South Timbuktu, was built in former times. This was the abode of a group of Bani Israel, all right, their tombs and wells were up till then. All right, and it's still in evidence. The Bunny of Israel, who formerly inhabited the area, cultivated lugamoons, the sale of which yielded them much profit. It was water from the wells rather than the river water that favored the growth of the lugamoons. All right, at the time of the Jewish kingdom, excuse me, at the time this Jewish kingdom existed, there reigned seven kings, all descendants from kings of Israel. All right, that was Jerub Aben Hisham. Dahu Yamin, Abin, Abid Al Hakim, Zaire Abin Salam. And I don't want to continue to butcher all these names, family. But we're going to continue on down here. It says, reality is not always free from the um, constraints of a subjective conceptual bias. The discovery of the site of ancient civilization immediately conjures up an extinct. Bani Israel kingdom, all right? So they actually know that this was a kingdom within Western Africa. And it was called Bani Israel. And this is actually the kingdom Eldad was talking about. And it's important to note that the Jews in Ethiopia called themselves Beta Israel, or House of Israel. And the Jews that actually broke off from Ethiopia and went beyond the rivers of Ethiopia into the Western Havila called themselves Banu Israel. All right, Beta Israel, Banu Israel. All right, so what is the evidence for this assertion? As Armuni pointed out, the names of the kings mentioned could be Arabic as well as Jewish. All right, so the Tariq al Fatash has in fact credited to Jews the work of an ancient people, most likely the Suniki people of ancient Ghana. All right, so these Jews, these Banu Israel, were these Suniki people. All right. And these are Mandi or Mandinkas. It's very important. And this is actually how we know Eldad was talking about Western Africa. And it's also important to note before we continue, if you've watched my Mandi Israelite history videos, these people 
claim descent from the tribe of Dan. All right, these people claim descent from the tribe of Dan as well. So that's another hard hitter. All right, so let's go ahead and connect this to another tribe real quick. And we're going to get this from our common manners and customs as Hebrew peoples. All right. So also a certain Eldad bin Mali, also known as Eldad the Danite, a 9th century well-learned Jewish traveler said to be a native of the black Jewish empire of Ghana. All right. Remember, who were the ancient people of Ghana? The Mandi. All right. And a historian identifies the Igbo as not just Hebrews, but Jews. He states that his tribe, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher, migrated from the land of Israel, the people of the clan of Dan, he says, left the land of their forefathers to avoid participating in Yerubim's wars of secession and residing in the land of Vila, beyond the land of Ethiopia. All right. So now let's connect this to the Ebos. And to do that, we're going to go to finding Gad, the quest for the lost tribe of Gad. All right. It's important to know that Eldad was actually a person who brought this whole Sambat Yon thing into existence. All right. He's the um, one who actually um, brought this whole Sambat Yon thing into existence. And we actually going to see that these Ebos are known. They are known as the Sambat Yon Jews. All right. The Sambat Yon Jews. So we're going to start up here at the top. The Igbo Jews are said to have migrated from Syrian, Portuguese, and Libyan Israelites into Western Africa. All right, we're going to skip down to the next highlighted because I've brought this source out plenty of times before. But it goes on to say the Syrian Jewish or the Syrian Jewish migrants, Dan, notice the tribes they're identifying as well. The Syrian Jewish migrants, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher, resettled in Nigeria. All right. Also, notice these are the same tribes that Eldad identified from coming into Africa and going beyond Ethiopia. So they actually say that some resettled in Nigeria, where they became known as the Sambat Yon Jews. <laughs> All right. Dad, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher resettled in Nigeria where they became known as the Sambat Young Jews. All right, credited to Eldad. In 1484 and in 1667, Judeans and Zebulans from Portugal and Libya respectively joined the Sambat Young Jews of Nigeria. All right, so they're known as the Sambat Young Jews of Nigeria. Thus, Nigerian Jews originated from the following six Israelite tribes Judah, Dan, right? Remember, Eldad, Naphtali, right? Eldad, Gad, Eldad, and Asher, Eldad, and also Zebulun, which came in later. So again, we can also identify Eldad's or traditions with the Ebo, with one of the Ebo migrations, all right? Because there were many, but one of the Ebo migrations, all right? Specifically, that Assyrian migration of Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. And again, it's also important to note these people are known as the somebody on Jews of Nigeria. So we're going to read a quick source from Herods.com. This is a, I guess you could say Jewish website. But it says, in favor of policies or politizing Jewish identity, it is impossible to rationally explain why the Ebos of Nigeria are not recognized as Jews when Ethiopian better Israel are. All right. So that's what it says. So let's start at the top. Well, let me say this real quick. Israelis knew about West African Jewry before Ethiopian Jewry. All right. It's important to note that Israelis knew about West African Jewry prior to or way before Ethiopian Jewry. So it's actually, you know, a little... Um, a hide, a, a cover-up going on, really, or a conspiracy, Psalms. But it says, let me demonstrate this with an example. One of my doctoral students recently completed research on the Igbo of Nigeria, many who consider themselves Jews, as well as on a futile attempt of a Jew, of their respectives or representatives to be recognized as Jews by the Israeli rabbinite. 
which would make them eligible for Aaliyah. His study shows that it is ultimately impossible to rationally explain why the Igbos have not been recognized when in the course of the 20th century, the Ethiopian tribes called Better Israel receives complete recognition of Jewish descent from one of the tribes or one of the 10 tribes of Israel. All right. And that can be credited to Eldad's um, or traditions because again, Eldad, you know, Eldad got the or traditions when he was in West Africa. This was a full blown migration from Egypt to Ethiopia to beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, across the Sahara, and to Western Africa, into the ninth century when you get to Eldad, all right? So yes, it, Eldad was talking about Jews in Ethiopia, but he was also talking about Israelites in Western Africa, because again, we see that most of these people came into Western Africa from the literature we just brought out. So it says, actually, the study shows British rabbis were already aware in the 1840s that there might be descendants of the 10 tribes in the Niger Delta, right? And we're not just talking about Evos right here. We're talking about Israelites, period. You know, we got your gods, you, you got your um, airways, your cons, you know, your other tribes within the Niger Delta, within the Niger River Basin. All right, so they already knew about all these Israelites in the 1840 within Western Africa. That even colors that even covers Ghana and Mali. It says that was even before, even before the process of acceptance of Beta Israel. Evidently, though, the Ebos who today number 20 to 30 million people would politically and demographically be dynamite, given the sheer number of potential Jews in Nigeria. It is no accident that Israeli authorities are hesitant to act. All right. So the main point in bringing this out, this source right here, was just to show that they already knew about these Israelites within Western Africa many, many years before they even brought or even um, started to accept Beta Israel as Ethiopia. All right. And with that, that's the end of the presentation. Again. Eldad or traditions literally told us a migration of Israelites starting in the nice, um, 900, um, 900 BCE with another wave coming in and meeting up with them in Eastern Africa around the 700, um, 700 BCE. All right. Then it's telling of them going into wars with the Cushetic tribes, them fleeing, them going beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. All right. Them crossing the Sambat Yon or the Sahara Desert. And them ending up in Western Africa, all right? This is why all these sources were saying that, you know, Eldad was from the kingdom of Ghana and this and that. And we also identified, you know, some of these tribes with, with who um, Eldad was talking about. So if you have any questions, you can go ahead and propose them. Go ahead and drop them in the chat, all right? And again, this is an overview of what we went over. Again, showing the or traditions, all right? Getting into the um, French source, letting us know that it was not talking about the Eastern Havila, so we had to identify what Havila it was speaking about. Then let us know that they actually left the Eastern Havila or Ethiopia and went beyond the rivers of Cush. All right, Benjamin of, Benjamin of Tudela or of Tudela lets us know that Chavila or Havila was in Ghana and a country lies west of Abyssinia. All right. Eldad then identifies or lets us know that the Sambat Yon River isn't even a river. You know, it's a waterless, um, it's a waterless torrent full of sand and stone and masses of wind. All right. Then we also have authors letting us know Eldad was from Western Africa, identifying him, you know, with um Western African kingdoms and things like that, with the Mandi Saniki people. Um, we Compared the traditions of Eldad going into Western Africa with the Saniki people of Ghana, right? Because that was the um, actually the empire that he was talking about when he went into North Africa, letting them know about the Jewish empire of the Sahara. And then we also compared that with the Igbos and their oral traditions and being known as the Sambat Yon Jews, all right? So we have all the right, you know, to say that, you know, Eldad was talking about West Africa. We have all the sources, all the proof. 
everything we need. All right. And again, anybody have any questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat for me. Shalom, shalom to everybody out there. All right, all right. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. A lot of us are Northern Kingdom Israelites, all right? And that's really why I go so hard for showing this information, man, because we've been, you know, lied to by the, the, the Camp Brothers in America. They really got people thinking, you know, Judah was sent to America. Levi to um, Levi to this place, um, Benjamin to this place. You know, that's not that's not possible. Our, our families were split up, you know. Our families were split up. So, yes, we do descend from uh, the Northern Kingdom, according to our ancestors or traditions, unless you are Khan, um, Airway, Limba, um, Sephardic, you're not really um, Judah. Yes, yes, we definitely don't need their validation, man. We don't need their validation. You know what I'm saying? Our traditions, you know, our customs, our histories, it's, a, it's enough. You know, everything we have is enough proof. You know, so like you said, we, we don't need the sons of Japheth <laughs> to recognize us. We do not need the sons of Japheth to recognize us, not whatsoever. And speaking of the sons of Japheth, man, if tomorrow um, I may... I'm not sure yet, but I may actually bring out some information, you know, regarding the scripture. Um, excuse me. Regarding the scripture, Japheth shall dwell in the tents of Shem because we had a visitor last week. I believe it was last week. A couple videos ago, a brother interrupting, the, you know, interrupting the chat all up in the chat, commenting things, being very disrespectful, respectful, very disruptive you know, very off topic, wanting to deal with DNA and um, try to disprove who we are, right? When I'm trying to break down the history of the Bantu, I'm not even dealing with DNA in that video. So, brother, if you're watching, I might have a video for you tomorrow. I may, if I um, feel like doing it later on, dealing with how, you know, the sons of Japhet, when actually when the Most High said that Shem, or Japhet shall dwell in the tents of Shem, that actually came from they actually came, you know, they actually came true. And we can prove that through genetics. Um, we can see that these people actually came into the Levant, pushed out the original sons of Ham and the original sons of Shem, took their culture, this and that. You know, and it's funny. I was actually able to find, you know, some hermetic markers in the, in the Levant in the Philistine, um, in the Philistine territories. So it's a, it's a lot, it's a lot that I can bring out with that because we, we know that it's a lot of, um, people claiming to be Canaanites, claiming to be Phoenicians, claiming to be Philistines. Well, it's like, yeah, you are, but you're not the original. You know, you're not the original Canaanites. You're not the original Philistines. You're not the original Phoenicians. You are the product of um, invasions, many years of invasions. All right. And um, I also can show <laughs> Haplo Group E1B1A in the Levant, um, since a lot of people like to say we're not in the Middle East or nothing like that. And again, of course, we are amongst. The, the um, original Jewish population. We were, E1B1A was a founding lineage in the Jewish population. You know, the sons, the 12 patriarchs, they would have had that haplo group. And we can prove that now, man. So I might come on do something showing, um, you know, how Jaffa came in, took over these people's um culture, took over the lands, and, you know, pushed the original sons of Ham into Africa. All right. But again, please, 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 if you have questions, drop them in the chat before we get ready to wrap this up. If not, I'll see you all um, either sometime tomorrow. If not, next Shabbat. All right. And, and again, thank everybody for tuning in. This was a very, very, very important video. 
All right. We've, uh, you know, showed that Eldad the Danite was a West African Hebrew. All right. He was a West African Hebrew. And he let us know that starting in the ninth, 900 BC, his people were coming into Africa. He let us know again. It was the second wave of Northern Kingdom Israelites in Africa. All right. And we traced this oral traditions all the way into West Africa. And we connected them with people. All right. So I see no more questions in the chat. No concerns, no comments. So again, please make sure to like this video, share it with your friends. All right, share it with your friends. And again, enjoy your Shabbat. Much love, much respect. Shalom to all.